My special guest today authored this book, The Five Masculine Instinctives. And we're going to be talking about today. His name is Chase Riplogle. Am I right? You got it. That was perfect. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's good to have you. And, it, you know, young men like this, when I have it on, have him on, because uh, I'm 83, uh, it makes me feel young. Because I remember when I was 30, <laughs> a long time ago, and uh, it's just, it, it brings youth out of me. I don't know what that is, but uh, good to have you. Yeah, well, thanks. It's great to be with you. So and I, to I us, feel great about a conversation as well. So Coming to us from Missouri. That's right. Yep. Uh, Ozark, Missouri. So just between Springfield and Branson, if people are familiar with it. And you and your wife like sailing. We do. Yeah, we like all sorts of outdoors. Uh, there's a lot to do in the Ozarks where we live, but we do. We have a little nothing fancy, a 25 year old sailboat that's actually older than I am that we keep on a lake nearby. And so, yeah, it's just about that time of year where the weather's right. So we'll we'll be up there soon. What size is your church? You're a pastor of a uh, first assembly. I am. Yeah. Uh, Bent Oak Church is the name of the church. It's an Assemblies of God church. And uh, the church is about 100 people. I uh, I really enjoy the relational part of pastoral ministry. So, uh, so you're a he, teacher. I, uh, I do a couple of things. So I do some writing on the side and then I also pastor as well. But yeah, I, I love being in the lives of people and being in the congregation where I know everybody's name and they've been in my home. And uh, my first and foremost, as much as I love writing, I'm, my real heart is I'm a pastor. And your mom and dad background. Yeah, so uh, they're both from this area, um, grew up around in the Ozarks, uh, got saved in their late 20s, and uh, that's kind of how we got started in Assemblies of God Church. But my dad was a state trooper for years, so we moved kind of all around the state of Missouri. Really? And uh, yeah, great parents, really, really grateful for Christian, godly parents. Did he have that uh, kind of military mind where... You do it, and that's the way you do it, exactly? Well, I tell you what, he was actually, part of what he did, he was a crime scene investigator, which oh meant he had polygraph training. So there was a lie detector test in the <laughs> trunk of his car at times. So I learned real quick uh, what to get, a, what I couldn't, couldn't get away with. But uh, my brother ended up becoming a Marine Corps captain. I became a pastor. Wow. So uh, yeah, well, I'm a family of service. And I think my dad, that was important for him, that you're willing to serve the people around you. And we all found our way of doing it. Are you an extrovert or introvert? Uh, I'm probably an extrovert, so I enjoy people, uh, like relationships. I enjoy a good dinner with friends. So yeah, put, probably put me in that category. And the desire to become a pastor. Cause I know you've got a call, have a call mm -hmm. and, and you, you just can't wake up one day and say, you know, oh, I think I'll try, try pastor. It's gotta be God's hand. When did that happen? Yeah, for me, that was in high school. The plan was to go to a secular university on a speech and debate scholarship. Um, I had um, been blessed to do well in that through high school. And so you're a brainiac. Laid out. Well, I, I wanted to do law and I'd always been interested in speaking and writing. And uh, and I very clearly felt in my uh, summer camp uh, during high school that God was calling to me to ministry. I think it was a shock to my parents and my debate coaches that I went to a little Bible college nobody had heard of instead of a scholarship at a, a larger state school. But uh, all along, you know, the Lord's been so faithful and in ways that were unexpected, you know, twists and turns in that process. But there's I like to use the word inevitability. There, there was just a sense of inevitability that this is what God was asking me to do. And if I would just be faithful to it, that he would see it through and he so has in so many so many ways so chase you had this the five masculine instincts rattling around in your brain up here someplace <laughs> and I, how do you how do you all of a sudden because you have to develop it how do you bring that so when we read it we catch it <laughs> Yeah, well, for me, this book comes out of a lot of conversations with men. As we've been talking about, I've got a brother, a father, I'm a man, I've got a son myself that I'm raising, and then my congregation has men in it. And I've witnessed over the last few years a lot of the questions, some of the controversy, the difficulty around the topic. And uh, the, the book really began as a series of conversations I was having with men in my life and trying to turn to scripture and understand what the Bible says about who we're supposed to be as men and how we can go wrong sometimes in that pursuit of manhood. Uh, some of it came through in preaching. I, I preached through books of the Bible. So a lot of the stories that uh, the biblical men that I portray in the book, those are drawn from my time in the word as a pastor and also personally. But uh, like any book, you spend a lot of time sitting down and working on it and writing and rewriting and trying to clarify. And I'm really grateful what came about through it. You, you had you had something that it, it's kind of 
it's not funny now, but it was fun. It's not funny when you had it, but it's funny now. You had hives. Yeah, and, and, this, it, and it, what 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 amazing to me is I actually learned something medical from your book. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, t- tell us the story of how you all of a sudden one day woke up with this. Uh, you, you thought incurable disease you had. Yeah. So I, I always start off by saying I've always been my whole life kind of a bacon cheeseburger kind of guy. I grew up deer hunting, usually processed the deer myself every year that we ate that most of the year. And uh, I did. I started having what we knew were allergic reactions to something. I've never been allergic to anything in my life, but all of a sudden I was my throat swelling. I was covered in hives. It wasn't going away. We were frantically trying to change shampoos and laundry detergents and food. Um, and I started to realize a co- correlation between when I would eat meat my reactions would be worse, which was kind of a a horrific thought to me. So I started Googling and it turns out in the geographical area I'm in and partly through the South, there's a a tick-borne disease called alpha-gal. It's short for alpha-galactose and a tick bite can actually leave you allergic to anything mammal. It's known as the mammalian meat allergy. The good news is it goes away five to 10 years, but uh, I'm sort of right in the middle of that time period. So for the last five years, I've suddenly found myself allergic to anything mammal based. So the meat, the dairy, uh, and you find out real quick, there's a lot of mammal in all sorts of products. So I, I write a little bit about it in the first chapter because as men, we love meat and this has been quite an experience. I I don't know what I'd do without a filet once in a while, (laughs) but, but you found, I think three ticks on you, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Pulled two off my ankle and one on the back of my leg. That was probably the one that that gave it to me, which, you know, if you're from the Ozarks, like I am, that's sort of a way of life in the summer, but uh, I've learned. And so have my friends and family learned to be a lot more careful about them. Amazing. And going into your book, it, you talk about, and this really stood out for me. Uh, be strong, Polycarp, play the man. And tell that story because in the book, I never looked at it that way, but you just, you know, magnified who he was. Yeah. So uh, that section you're referring to, uh, Mark Batterson, pastor of National Community Church in DC, was kind enough to provide the foreword for the book. He's right. written on men before too. And he recounts this story of Polycarp, who was martyred, uh, martyred in front of crowds that were cheering for his execution. And he looked to heaven uh, as he was being killed, and he heard this heavenly voice say to him, play the man, Polycarp, which is a way of saying, take courage. It's actually a little more common in the Bible. Um, David will say upon his passing to his son Solomon, show yourself to be a man. Paul actually says it to the elders uh, of Ephesus when he's greeting them, be men. Uh, It's a way of saying, which I think is an important message to men today, the world is complicated and dangerous and full of risks, but rise to that occasion. Bear this responsibility well. Don't shrink from it, but step into it as difficult and as challenging as it may be. That that theme comes through both in the lives of great men and women of faith and also in scripture as well. You know, you've got a lot of life ahead of you. And I come born in 1939. Sounds like sounds like my phone just went off. Uh, I, in 1939, and and I had a lot of life ahead of me, and very little left. But you have much life ahead of you, and you're seeing politics, and the changing of America, and the changing of our freedom. How does that affect a guy as young as you are, children? very young, and you've got this future ahead where you see politics just absolutely going crazy. Where does that deliver you in thinking? Yeah, well, I'm keenly aware of um, the reality that hiding from it isn't an option I have for me nor my kids. Um, As easy as it might be to sort of put your head in the sand and just say, well, I'm going to kind of hole up in my church with my people and my the the world is just changing too much. That's not a possibility for me or my children. I was reading. uh, You'll be familiar with C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. It's an interesting book because it's a fictional Yeah, a fictional story of a tempter tempting a man away from God. So everything's kind of in reverse. But there's one of the letters in the screw tape letters where the tempter is explaining that as much as we want to tempt humanity, man, into vice, one of the dangers of vice is 
it often leads to war and revolution and collapse. And those are the very things that suddenly make morality clear to the man again. Yes. And I think we're experiencing a little bit of that. I think we've seen it in some of the global events lately. Um, all of a sudden, what matters most, what's really right or wrong, what it looks like for a man to rise to the occasion and bear responsibility well, suddenly seems clearer to us. And so my prayer is that as our culture continues to move further and further away from God, away from uh, the reality of, of truth itself, of morality, right and wrong, that it will lead to a place where as believers, there is a kind of new clarity to the way we're living, if we're willing to do it, if we're willing to, to, to live well and hold on to truth, that maybe that becomes more clear to the world around us. Um, I think Lewis understood that well, and I think we see some of that happening, and I hope continues to happen in, in greater ways in the future. Yeah, can you imagine when he wrote that, what year it was? Mm, yeah, yeah. He understood in the context of World War II very clearly that yes, things yes. like war, and I think what we're seeing in Ukraine as well, too, it brings a kind of moral clarity to what, what the world actually needs and how it actually works. And I hope that does wake our culture up to a sense of there are things that are right and wrong. There is a source of absolute truth beyond just ourselves or our emotions that we really need to get a hold of again. And yet, as you read the New Testament, Paul and all of the prophets and the writers of the of the New Testament and even Old Testament, the politics that they lived in and Paul writing from prison, knowing that in just a few weeks he would be murdered, killed. And when we think today we're concerned about our freedom, well, we may walk that road mm -hmm. or you may. <laughs> I may be in yeah, heaven. Or my kids. I think about that with soberness as well. Yes. The, the, the five masculine instincts, and you talk about them as sarcasm, adventure, ambition, reputation, apathy. And then you tag names to those. For example, sarcasm, Cain. Share that. Yeah, well, it's important to say that these instincts are not expectations. Men should have these, nor are they sins. These are the ways men sin. Um, we often have that conversation, rightfully so, with men. Sometimes it gets framed around things like money, sex, and power. Uh, but what I wanted to look at with the book is to push that conversation deeper into men's lives and say, well, why those particular sins? Why are you tempted the way you're tempted? Why do you behave the way that you behave? And what's interesting about instincts is sometimes they're they're motivating us, they're leading us to actions without us having really considered them or decided. They are impulses, desires, instincts that we just assume and we act upon without really understanding what they are. So each of the instincts in the book, I actually draw them from Shakespeare's stages of a man. There's a famous monologue, all the world's a stage. And he goes on to describe these parts that men play throughout their life. And so each of those stages he describes is one of the instincts in the book. And I use a biblical character to try to unpack what that instinct looks like in their life so that we might be able to recognize it as well. So Cain um, has that sarcasm personality. Yeah, the big question of Cain's life is why does God reject his sacrifice and accept Abel's? And what struck me about that story is every pastor and commentator has tried to deal with it. Uh, God comes down and initiates a conversation conversation with Cain. He says to him, why are you downcast? Don't you know sin is crouching at your door? It's desires to rule over you. Cain, all he has to do is say, why did you reject my sacrifice? And he has this incredible opportunity to learn from God what God requires of him. But what does Cain do? He doesn't respond to God. He rises up and strikes down his brother. When God comes back to him and says, where is your brother Abel? You hear the sarcasm. Am I my brother's keeper? Um, sarcasm can be a funny joke. There's nothing wrong with a moment of sarcasm. But there's also an instinct within some men, often young men, that refuse to take anything seriously, that refuse to grow up, that feel like anybody who might question them or challenge them is somehow judging them unjustly, as Cain certainly felt. And that sarcasm, that making everything a joke, can actually just be a contempt for authority, which it certainly is in the life of Cain. Adventure, Samson. There is this cultural narrative right now that tells young people, it's in all the movies my kids see, uh, that to know who you really are, your true identity, you have to leave behind tradition and family and place and religion and discover your true identity on some sort of quest. 
it didn't take me long to see that instinct in the life of Samson. Samson, you might remember, doesn't take the Nazarite vow on his own. His mother is given the message to raise him as a Nazarite. Right. It's like a family tradition he's born into. And he's, he's at a time in Israel's history where they're not particularly powerful. They're being raided by all of their neighbors. There's no standing army, no centralized government. And so it's not surprising that the young man, Samson, would find himself looking down on those great Philistine cities and being intrigued by everything Phil Philistine, the women, the adventure, the risk, the danger. But unlike our culture's narrative that self-actualization, meaning, comes from this pursuit of self, Samson does that. And the more those stories play out, the more the adventure he has, the duller he seems, the less discerning he seems, the less he recognizes what it is God's trying to do in his life. It doesn't deliver on that promise that our culture tells us it does. So as men, we've got to make sure we're keeping that adventure. Again, not a wrong thing, a sinful thing, but if overindulged can lead to really destructive behavior in a man's life. Yeah, when you're reading about him, when when he finds that woman and he says, I want her. Yeah, she's right in my eyes is the <laughs> phrase, which is that great theme of, of the book of Judges, what's right in each one's eyes. Wow. Yeah, there's no God that I'm responsible to. It's whatever I see, I want to do this quest and adventure and desire for self. It's so today, isn't it? Yeah, that of all the chapters, this one particularly struck me for young men is this is the cultural narrative that they're being told that to know who you are and have a meaningful life, you have to go out there and discover it in yourself. And and, and that's Samson, just it, it leads to ruin in Samson's life. And Samson had that movie star looks. Yeah. You know, He's it's the like, quintessential man, right? Yeah. And so yeah, women and romance and adventure and Long it's hair. everything you would imagine. Yeah, right. <laughs> and my muscular, he was like the Schwarzenegger of that day. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh -huh. it, he ends up dull and undiscerning and, and dumb to what God is doing in his life, which is the real tragedy of it. Ambition. Moses. Moses is such an interesting character because at times his ambition motivates him to action. He strikes down an Egyptian and the book of Acts tells us he expects that the Hebrew people would rally behind him. He'd lead them. They don't. They end up mocking him. Who made you prince over us? So he flees to the wilderness. At other times, that ambition seems to be absent. When God comes to him at the burning bush, you would think Moses would say, this is that very thing I was trying to do. Finally, a second chance. But instead, he's reluctant. You know, I'm slow of speech. And how will they know you sent me? And can't you send someone else? That's the lived experience of ambition. When we have a vision of something great we want to do or achieve, there's nothing like that ambition to one moment make us feel empowered and invincible and the very next moment, sometimes the same day, discouraged and defeated and disillusioned about it altogether. Uh, there's a tendency in Moses's life to measure everything by the fulfillment of that vision. He judges himself. He judges the people. He ends up judging God, and it will cost him the fulfillment of that ambition. He won't enter the promised land with him, but God will ask him to put that ambition down because ultimately it had outpaced God. It had become such an obsession in his life that it kept him from recognizing what God was actually asking him to do and led him into some real disobedience, striking the rock instead of speaking to it, chastising the people. Yes, yes. We provide water from this rock. He starts to misplace himself with God, and that's one of the dangers of ambition. Isn't it amazing the home that he landed in and taught by the finest of teachers, and then he blows it when he sees an Israelite being uh, fighting each other and almost wanting to kill each other, and he steps in, and when it's repeated, what do you want us to do? You're going to kill us like you did that Egyptian? And, and then he, for 40 years, it's like, I missed it, you know, because so many times when something crosses your path, I mean, he could have thought, hey, you know, I had my opportunity back there. It's gone. It never will come back. But look what God does. In each of these stories, there is a sense that God redeems this instinct for something yeah. good. Yes. So in the story of Samson, there's the great line towards the end when his eyes have been gouged out and his hair shaved off and he's chained to a wall, uh, the temple of Dagon, the Philistine God. There's a great little line where it says, but the hair began to grow back on his head. Yeah. That ultimately the thing that Samson couldn't do, God, by his grace, restores in, in his Praise life, what a, what gives a him a better adventure. And what I a heard message. a professor one time lecturing on uh, the story of Jesus's transfiguration and the fact that it was probably this mountain near the Sea of Galilee. And of course, that scene when Jesus is transfigured before his disciples, his clothes begin to glow. 
who is it that joins him in that moment of transfiguration? It's the prophet Elijah and it's Moses. And it struck me that although Moses died on Mount Nebo, seeing the promised land, but not entering it, having to lay down that great ambition, that ultimately he did make it into the promised land, not through his effort in his earthly body, but there transfigured with Christ, Moses was in the promised land. So for all of these characters, there is a sense that when we set that instinct aside, and when we instead offer it to God and allow him to work a better instinct of faith into our life, we check that natural instinct and instead turn to this instinct of faith, that God has a way of redeeming those things that are often broken, that feel like dead ends, that aren't leading us somewhere. He certainly does it with these men in the Bible who are complicated and, and not always uh, not, not always righteous individuals. There are certainly men who, who go astray, and yet God redeems their stories in powerful ways. So solid. That, that is so solid. Reputation, David. <laughs> you you could spend the rest of the time just talking about this guy and what he what he fell into. Yeah, well, he fits what we were just describing so well. Um, David is in the world of Saul. Saul is the first king. He's the king asked for. His name literally means the one asked for. The people demand a king. They take one look at Saul, and what do they recognize? It's not his administrative abilities. It's not his uh, oratory. It's not his you know experience. He's tall and handsome. He looks like a king and they crown him king. And in many ways, Saul's story is him unraveling under the pressure of that public image that he can't quite rise to. And the defensiveness, the fear, the anxiety he feels when somebody like David comes around who may threaten that reputation or public image. So David inherits that temptation, this discrepancy between who he appears to be, God's king, a man after God's own heart, the leader of Israel, and the truth, the integrity of his actual life. At moments, he gets that right in pretty powerful ways. He takes off Saul's armor and he goes out to face Goliath as who he is, a shepherd with God in his defense. But of course, he has moments where he gets it drastically wrong as well. He commits sin with Bathsheba, but then makes it significantly worse by murdering her husband, plotting against him to cover up that sin, and then imagining he gets away with it. Uh, Oftentimes we think of this word of integrity. Um, it's kind of a, a word you'll see coming into an election season in yes. yard signs of politicians, right? A man of integrity. We tend to think it means something like I all I always do what's right, or when no one's looking, I'll do I'll be consistent. But I like to think of integrity instead as a willingness to take responsibility and own all of your life, both the good and the bad. But you know where you have fallen short and you're willing to inventory your whole life and deal with those things instead of this tendency we sometimes have as men to compartmentalize or sweep things under the rug, yes. as David did. We talked about how each of these have a kind of redemptive feature to them. The thing that's always struck me as remarkable about David's story is we, we know the, the whole truth. Uh, David is a powerful king. He could have burned the records. He could have silenced anyone who was speaking against him. Uh, we live in an era where politicians spend millions of dollars to cover up sins and to hire image consultants. And yet David bears all. He leaves behind the records, good and bad. He leaves behind his own words, his prayers of repentance, his psalms, right. that there's a kind of life of confession, a true integrity that doesn't always mean David did what was right, but means he was willing to be honest about everything in his life before God. And, and we get to see it, which is a remarkable thing. That statement. Um, he was a man after God's own heart, knowing his life. And you read that and you go, maybe I can be used. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it puts each of us in that position of saying, don't think it's over. And then we and then and you have number five, which is apathy. Abraham, we got about four minutes. And if you could, in this four minutes, go out with an opportunity for someone to trust Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Apathy is an important one because as we age, we begin to realize how complicated the world is. Things that in our youth we might have thought we could have controlled, we suddenly discover are hard to. And they cost us too much. And there's a tendency in men to withdraw, to retreat. It's true of Abraham's life and his great moments. He leads by faith. But when things get complicated, there's a tendency for him to withdraw from that complexity. And of course, the great ending of his story is a kind of false ending. He looks like he's retiring. He plants a tamarisk tree and sits under it. But yet God calls him in that turning of the page to chapter 22. God tested Abraham and calls him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. He wakes him up out of that risk of apathy and into the engagement of faith. Um, what I hope the book is at the end is uh, Paul gave some advice to the young man, Timothy, to watch your life closely 
and the doctrine closely. He was talking about how you make progress as a man. And it's by knowing your instincts and it's by knowing what you have in Christ. And that's the thing I think men desperately need right now are those two things brought together. Truthfulness about my instincts and motives, but also at the same time, a willingness to turn and see what Christ has done for me, what Christ has given me, and to bring those resources of Christ back into my heart and the truth of my life. Mm -hmm. So it's a hard moment for men. There's a lot of challenges in our culture, but there's incredible opportunity. And Christ, by his grace, wants to build you and develop you and discipline you and grow you into the kind of man that can serve families well and serve communities well and serve the church well. And I would just say to any men listening, we, we need you fully engaged, not apathetic, not sarcastic, but with everything Christ has offered you, engaging those responsibilities of life. And Christ is the way forward to do that. Chase, stay strong, will you? Yeah. Because you're steadfast. I'm hearing unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, 40 years from now, I want, I, I want you to be there. You know, yeah, you know that's I mean? my prayer too. Thank you. Be, be, because this world is so attractive, even in the church, even in the pulpit. And I love the fact that you say, I've got about 100 in my congregation. I, something, I, I like that closeness. I like that smallness. I like that intimacy. And you have that in your congregation, mm -hmm. but we covered five of them, the five masculine instincts. Let me tell you, this is worth the read. It's his first book. And I, I it's hard for me to believe that because I've read some books where I've had a guy that's, this is his 25th or whatever. And this is, a, it's hard to believe if, if he told me, I, this is my 15th, I'd say, I, I can understand, but Get your copy. All of the information is on the screen. And uh, if you'd like to have Chase or get a hold of him or whatever, you have that opportunity to make contact. And that's always neat. But what I'm hearing uh, from this author, <laughs> I would love to be able to cold turkey someday, just walk into his church and have the pleasure of listening to Chase speak. Uh, Chase uh, Replogle. You got it. And uh, I hope that you contact the contacts that you had before, Linda, and if you write any more books or whatever, because I'd love to have you expound once again. Mm, and thank uh, you. and it just my way of checking on you, make sure you're still there and you're still <laughs> you're still preaching the gospel and raising those kids right and loving That's your my wife. Plan. My wife and I are uh, this uh, May, we will be celebrating our. 63rd anniversary. It's amazing. Congratulations. So the Lord is good. Stay faithful. God bless. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. <laughs>